Aloha, friends. It's Robert Stelic. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Blue Planet Show, where I interview foil athletes, designers, and thought leaders. And you can watch this show right here on YouTube or listen to it on your favorite podcast app. Today's interview is with Ken Winner, the designer at Duotone, uh, wing designer extraordinaire. And as always, I ask questions not just about equipment and technique, but also try to find out more about his background, what inspires him, and how he got into water sports. So Ken was really open in this interview, shared a lot of information about wing design, even showed his computer screen where he designs wings. So that's at kind of at the very end of the interview, so you, you don't want to miss that part. It's really cool if you're into wing design and want to know more about the materials and the construction, the design, and Ken's philosophy. This is a really good show for all that kind of information. During this interview, I'm going to play a little bit of footage of Alan Cadiz wing foiling in Kailua. I got some drone footage of him, which was kind of after this interview, but he's using the 2023 Duotone unit wing, 4.5 meter wing. So uh, I'll play some of that in the background. Um, thank you so much for your time, Ken, and for sharing all the detailed information. So without further ado, here is Ken Winner. Okay, good morning, Ken. How are you doing today? Good morning, I'm pretty good. All right. It's kind of a little bit of a rainy and windy day here on Oahu. How, how's the weather on Maui? Uh, same. Same, yeah. Yep. So have you had super stormy winds the last last few days? Um, it's been crazy windy here. Yeah, it's been gusting 35, 40, 45 at times. Do you actually go out in those kind of conditions or or do you wait? Um, yeah. Yeah. Windy days? yeah, it's it's pretty fun. Yeah, so you've been doing what? You, what do you do on days like that? You go on a downwinder, or you just go? Um, go you know, I only do downwinders with my wife nowadays. Um, mm -hmm. That's her favorite thing. Uh, otherwise, uh, I launch from a friend's house over on Stable Road, and um, Peter Slate actually uh, lives on Stable Road, and uh, so we launch there, go out, race around a bit, test different wings hydrofoils nice um, what kind of equipment were you on in, on those super windy days uh you know anything from a two to a four sometimes we go out pretty overpowered just because we have something we want to try and we don't have many choices um you know i mean some days we just have to go and do what we can with what we have um, <clears throat> we do a lot of prototyping in the four and five meter size. We do uh, a fair amount in the three meter size, and then uh, you know smaller and bigger. We also prototype and test quite a bit, but maybe not as intensely. Nice. Okay, but yeah, before we get more into all the equipment and stuff like that, I wanted to get uh, talk a little bit about your background. So. Tell us a little bit about, like, starting in the beginning, like, wh how, where you grew up and, and how you got into water sports and all that kind of stuff. Well, I was born a long time ago, 1955, so there's a lot of history there. You don't want to hear it all. Grew up near Annapolis, Maryland. Um, did a fair amount of recreational cruising-type sailing. My dad owned boats. Um, built a lot of stuff when I was a kid. Owned a couple boats when I was a teenager, started windsurfing in 75. Um, how, how, how extensive do you want this to be? Started windsurfing in 75, won the world championship in 77. Um, we won again in 80. Uh, in 81, we had the, right there on Oahu where you are, we had the World Cup, the Pan Am World Cup, which I won. Um, yeah. Actually, I mean, yeah, don't don't worry about making it short. Like we, we got time. So just kind of actually like how, how did you get into windsurfing? Like what what was your first experience with that? Or like what were you doing anything other um, like surfing or water sports before windsurfing? You no, know, I've never actually surfed. Um, as I said, I grew up sailing. Uh, I when I was a teenager, maybe 17 or 16, I bought a, a little old wooden boat, a little wooden boat, a Bahamas cat boat, uh, fixed it up so it was saleable and sailed that around a bit. <clears throat> Kept it at a friend's house. 
Um, I also bought a shark catamaran, sailed that a bit. Um, so I was into sailing and I, I saw an ad for a windsurfer and thought that would be a good thing for me to try. So I bought a used windsurfer. Um, I also about the same time bought a hang glider. So I taught myself to hang glide. And, uh, but I really enjoyed the windsurfing more. So sold everything else and just uh, focused on windsurfing. Um, so that you were around 20 years old. Um, yeah, about 20. Yeah. What, um, did you do you have any like formal education or did you go like straight into yeah windsurfing? it's funny I was going to University of Maryland when I started windsurfing and <clears throat> I might have stuck with that but I started windsurfing racing and winning races and thinking oh I can always go to college I can spend a little time windsurfing and um, and then when I'm ready to quit, I can go back to school, but I never did actually go back to school. I just <laughs> kept windsurfing um, for the next, well, forever. <laughs> next 23 so, but years. Ba so basically you're self-taught, like all the the um, knowledge you have on with computers and aerodynamics or, you know, all that is basically from experience and self-taught kind of thing or? Yeah, I do a lot of reading. Uh, I remember in, Sometime in the early 80s, um, Barry Spanier, I think, got a book. The title is The Aerohydrodynamics of Sailing. And uh, I, you know, I heard him make a comment about it, so I got it. And I read it from cover to cover several times and really absorbed, I think, the lessons of that. And um, did a lot of other reading after that. But that was sort of my foundation for learning about uh, the technical side of sailing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, nowadays, of course, it's super easy to get a lot of information online, really good information. Uh, so unless you're pursuing uh, a career like attorney or doctor or degreed engineer or um, PhD scientist, you don't need uh, formal education as much as you used to. Right. If, if you need it at all, I don't know. But um, yeah, I think as long as you're a lifelong learner, you can pretty much teach yourself almost anything, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, um, yeah, a lot, a lot of things for sure. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to do some screen sharing here. Um, the, from the windsurfing hall of fame so um there's like a little bit of information about you online here so in the so you started windsurfing in 1975 that's i mean this was the day, days when they the booms were still made out of wood and so on right i mean talk a little bit about your first right. uh, first wind, windsurfing uh setup I uh, bought a used board for 300 bucks and went out, taught myself to use it, and uh, just became hooked like most people. Um, did it every chance I had. Um, and, uh, well, at first all I focused on was trying to improve my skills. That was 100% of my effort. But then the, gradually over time I got more interested in improving the equipment. So over time, I did some things like built my own boards and built my own rigs, masts, spoons. Um, yeah, and um, you start you started winning a lot of races. So you were very focused on the um, racing side of windsurfing, or also I guess freestyle as well, right? Kind of. Yeah, area. so I won the freestyle world uh, two or three times, and. That was back when it was a much simpler affair than it is now. Of course, the guys who do freestyle nowadays uh, sail circles around all of us who did freestyle back then. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. they loop circles around us. Um, but you, you got to start somewhere in every sport. Um, and so that, that's a picture of Robbie and Jurgen Hunscheid and me um, at the Pan Am, the Pan Am Cup, actually. Um, which was right there on Oahu, over in Kailua. Yeah. So, and and you were able to beat Robbie, I guess, 
at that point um still and i mean you you have several world um world titles right in in windsurf racing um yeah i mean robbie and i were rivals to some extent but he was younger and when he got to be uh when he achieved his full adult strength he was extremely hard to beat. so you know i started when i was 20 he started when he was about nine and and uh, it's no surprise that he's dominated the sport so much for so many years he's an amazing athlete and a really great guy um good entrepreneur he's got a great business um and so and we're still rivals so it's <laughs> been a good it's been a good 40 some years mm -hmm. and then you you started build, you said you started building your own boards and and making smaller and smaller boards right yeah so i <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, I I built a uh, a nine foot board. Uh, actually, prior to that, I had a a board shaped for me in, in glass, and that was a board. I would say I basically invented carving jibes because everybody had square tail boards back then. I had a round tail board, which allowed me to carve through my jibes instead of skid through them. Um, and Basically, from that point onward, I focused a lot on trying to improve my equipment. Um, I, <laughs> you're showing a picture of the transatlantic windsurf race, which was a, a pretty funny boondoggle. That was uh, in about 98, I think. Um, but this has got to be pretty boring for anybody watching. I mean, oh. people are interested in what's happening now. Not yeah, no, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think so at all. I don't think anybody's going to find this boring at all. But um, mm -hmm. so yeah, just keep, like um, yeah, and then I guess you um, yeah, I mean, tell us a little bit about how you got into um, the wing wing design or like I guess were you designing windsurfing sails for um, Duotone before kites or like how or and then. Yeah, just tell okay, us a little so, bit about how you, how you got yeah, into Yeah, so I, I windsurfed intensely for 23 years. I, I guess in 97, I think I won the U.S. racing championships. And then just shortly after that, I tried kiting for the first time. And basically, after I tried kiting for the first time, I... Um, I sold all my windsurfing gear and got straight into kiting. My 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 first kite experience was with Don Montague right off Stable Road on Maui. He was out kiting, I was out windsurfing, and I told him I wanted to try that. So he handed me his control bar and he leashed his board to my ankle and he told me how to steer the kite. And I so I kited back and forth down to Kanaha the next half hour and um so that was my that's how i got hooked on kiting and so from the very so, first yeah. session you were able to stay stay upwind and everything and, and no no i didn't stay upwind i ended up <laughs> i ended up down at kanaha so right. starting at camp one ending up at kanaha oh, okay and uh yeah so and one you know not long after that i spent a week on maui and kiting every day and um and then a few months after that, I I did some I did a how to kiteboard video because there were no schools, hardly anybody knew how to learn. So I I did some videos. The Nash guys, Robbie was saying he needed uh, some how to kite videos, so I took the opportunity to do that. We sold about thirty thousand videos, and then of course schools came along and the internet came along. So that was it was. You don't need that kind of stuff anymore. It's all online. Yeah. Oh, so you had a, like a VHS tape on how how to how to kite and um, sold it like through magazines and stuff like that with mail, I mail actually order. Used, I used the Nash distributor network to the dealer network to um, sell boxes of videos to dealers who would then retail them to customers. Hmm. Uh, and I had a website, so I could retail videos directly to to the customers. Um, and we actually did a total of three 
how-to videos over a couple of years' time. Um, okay. And then I helped convince Boards and More, which is the parent company of Duotone and um, Fanatic, to get into kite boarding, kite, you know, making kites. Mm -hmm. And so that was about the year 2000. And um, we tried to hire people to do the job of designing kites, but there were so few kite designers at the time that I ended up taking it on. So I had to do a crash course in learning how to design a kite. I spent weeks and weeks and weeks in China working 16 hours a day, um, learning a learning how to use computer-aided uh, design software, CAD software, and then um, you know pumping up existing kites and trying to figure out the geometry and trying to figure out how to do that on the computer. Um, uh, ultimately, it worked. So we ended up with a decent kite and. Um, Started growing the company from that point. Okay. Um, so boards and more at that time they had um, the brand was Fanatic and or what, what were their brands that they were running? Well, it, I'm just going to say boards and more is the parent company of the you know the parent company that I work for now, mm -hmm. which is uh, we we produce Duotone kites and Fanatic windsurfing gear and kite surfing and sup surfing gear and you know. Stuff foiling gear. So, um, Boards and More is the company I've been working for for the last twenty-two years. Um, and and so um, right now, what what is your official role at at Duotone? I, I know you know, like I just wanted to say, like I've been waiting such a long time to get you on the show because you're always so busy. Um, you said you have to, you know, like, like come up with a whole new line of wings and kites and and everything so you were too busy to to uh, meet with me but um yeah tell me a little bit about like your job like your role and um how you were able to make time today to come here <laughs> <clears throat> yeah um yeah great question i uh i tend to overcommit and try to do more things than i can reasonably do so a few years ago i was designing kites but i also decided to start designing hydrofoils and that turned into a lot of work. And then I started designing wings and that turned into even more work. So I was able to push the foil design work off on some very capable guys that we have in Mauritius and in Germany. And uh, then more recently, I've been able to push the kite design work off on Sky Solbach. Now, uh, Sky has been working with me for 18 years. Uh, well, we've both been learning a lot about kite design, and in the last year, so I've been helping him master the software that we use for kite design. And so now he's doing the kite design, and I would say that he's he's for sure one of the most experienced and capable kite designers in the world. Even though uh, he hasn't been the lead on kite design until recently, but. He is now, and he's doing a great job. He's making some really great improvements. So he's having like a good teacher, right? <laughs> I hope so. So uh, having having uh, so now I'm just focused on wings. And so that like your job basically at Duotone right now is wing wing designer. Yeah, I'm I'm focused on wing design now, and we have two main wing models: the unit and the slick. The unit has handles. The slick has a boom. And the unit is more focused on wave riding and downwinding. The slick is more uh, free ride and freestyle. Um, unit has a little bit more wingspan, slick has a little less wingspan. The, um, okay, so before we go into the current gear, let, let's go back to when you first started uh winging and you know like how you came up with the wing i i interviewed um mark rapahorst and alan cadiz as well on the show and they both talked about how you know you guys used to go out um downwinding together with the stand up paddle foil boards and um and then you know when like one day you showed up with the with the wing so can you talk a little bit about that 
like how you first came up with the wing and the inflatable wing design and so yeah, on. Yeah, I was trying to downwind hydrofoil with these guys and I wasn't doing it that well. I wasn't having great success and I was getting a sore shoulder. So I was trying to figure out how could I, how could I do downwind hydrofoiling and, and not uh, get a sore shoulder. And I, by chance, I saw a video of Flash Austin with his homemade a uh, handheld wing that he was using on a hydrofoil at Kanaha. And I thought, um, you know, eight years before I had designed some inflatable handheld wings for supping, not with a hydrofoil, but just for sup. And so I thought, well, I wonder if something like that would work. It fits my skill set because I do inflatable adult toys. And so I, you know, I went home, got on the computer, designed uh, a crude, another crude handheld inflatable wing. Um, so those and, designs uh, are, um, you know, you sent me an email with some pictures. Is that from that time um, when you designed your first wings? Um, uh, yeah, right. But that that blue and black wing was my first effort to do a handheld inflatable wing. Um, my idea was to use it on a sup board and. That was back in 2010. Sky and oh, I so, tried it. So this one was the one, um, the original one that you made for um, for basically wind windsurfing on or an, on a regular windsurf board. Well, a sub board, yeah. Sub board. board, okay, yeah. Oh, and so it and, was very similar to what what we have today, actually. You know. Yeah, yeah, it has some similarities. Yeah. So and then um, you would hold one hand would go here and one hand here. Yeah, that's how it was at first. Okay. And, uh, you know, I tried another one a month or two later, and Sky and I tr didn't, you know, we tried and we didn't really think it was that much fun. Um, another guy who designs for us took the idea and made an inflatable windsurfing rig. We, mm. we call it the iRig, which was pretty nice for kids, very low impact. So I remember that. So in that in that picture of six wings, you can see the first two in 2010, 2011, and then in 2018, I tried something. I just um, yeah, just very quickly threw something together. I modified an existing like uh, Neo design, and like Neo is one of our kites, and sent that off to the factory. And and then when I took it to the beach and stepped on the board and sailed away it popped up I popped up on the foil immediately and sailed right out to the reef so um, turning around I fell and I had trouble getting going again but basically I considered that a success and I figured well that would allow me to do downwinders um, without stressing my shoulders so uh, I kept building prototypes after that uh, sky went this was June of 2018 sky went to a dealer meeting in Tarifa and and demonstrated it for everybody everybody there and nobody was interested <laughs> so, yeah. and then we took it to the AWSI show in in August and nobody was interested but then finally in November people started getting interested so um, I got our CEO uh, out on one Till Eberle he's a he used to be a snowboarder on the German national team so he's a really good athlete and he had thought it looked too complicated and difficult, but then when he tried it, he discovered that it's not too complicated and difficult. And he thought, well, maybe we, sh we can make some of these and, and, and people will buy them. So at that point, we decided we were going to go into production with wings. And I think, I think some other brands decided at that point it might be an interesting concept. So, um, and we then were, I was we just showing were, a picture of your um of your wife and then you also sent me this little video so she she was um the first you said probably the first woman to uh wing foil is that correct yes yeah, sky's wife christine and julie both tried it out i i think right around christmas time of 2018 and then after that uh julie got very interested in it um, 
And I took her out at Kihei quite a few times. And I think this was her first time on the North Shore. <laughs> she was she was a little excited by the size of the swell. Mm -hmm. um, so nowadays, she, she really enjoys doing downwinders from Malika to the harbor. And she can do it in about 35 minutes if she's in a hurry. And um, uh, it's her favorite sport. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, so and then this was your first uh wing design, the the foil wing. And I actually got one of those. I've been I was waiting for a long time and then finally got the the wing. And I think it was a three meter, the first one I got. And it was uh uh yeah, it was super cool because kind of the same same as you were we were trying to do the foil downwind runs and really mm -hmm. uh, kind of it's really hard actually, right? So um but talk a little bit about this this first wing design and because it had a boom and no strut and then it had full battens and so on. So you can talk a little bit about this wing. Your first yeah, prototype. well, you know, starting from scratch, we had no idea, I had no idea really what what to do with it. We, you know, we tried different dihedral angles and different dihedral patterns. And I put battens in it because um, that reduces the uh, fluttering by quite a bit. Nowadays, we don't have the long battens because we've found other ways to reduce the flutter. Um, but, I mean, some of us have. A lot of brands go ahead and continue making wings with a lot of flutter, but I don't really care for that. Um, the boom... Uh, you know, I made my first few wings with handles, as you saw in the photo, and I really hated the handles. Then I went to a kind of a strap-on rigid handle. Uh, and then after that, I thought, well, why should I have a strut and a boom or strut and a handle when I can just have this one boom or long tube and potentially save money and hassle? Um, so that was the reasoning there. But... It turns out the, the strut is really nice for stabilizing draft. Um, and so we went back to using a, a strut sometime later. Yeah, like I, I know the that first wing, it, it was kind of, it did that tick-tocking thing, right? When when you held it by the front handle, it, it didn't really behave very well. Um, just luffing yeah. behind you, it didn't. Um, yeah. So was that, I guess, part of the reason for that was because it didn't have that strut to kind of stabilize it? Um, yeah, I think the strut it kind of acts like a rudder in some respects, helps stabilize the wing. Um, you know, it's really, it's really hard to know what's going to be important to people when you're starting with something new. One of the, one of the things I have to do is I have to, I can't just pay attention to the things I like to do, I have to pay attention to what other people like to do. So right. um, at first, to me, the idea of holding the wing by the front handle, uh, I just never did it. I would I would always hold it by the boom. Um, so right. I never really noticed that instability when I was using it myself. Yeah, <clears throat> but, but basically, yeah, that's what how when I used it on a wave, I would just hold the front of the boom and it and it worked fine. But um, but then, yeah, I guess some of the other wings were really stable, just holding it in the front handle and you'd be able to surf with it, just holding the front handle, which um, mm -hmm. which then, I guess, so, yeah. And so it, and it, it, another thing that's kind of interesting is if, if you want a wing that will be pretty stable when you're just flying it on the leash, we experimented with that a bit and the thing we found is that if i let the air out of my wing and let it get a little bit floppy like take it down to uh three or four psi it will fly on the leash um really stable but then if i pump it back up to eight psi and i and i have a really tight top canopy which is something i like then it's no longer really stable on the mm. leash so so far we kind of have to make the choice: do we want it, do we want our wing more floppy and therefore it will fly on a leash, or do we want our wing more stable, in which it's less stable on the leash but it's more stable otherwise? And uh, <clears throat> right so now, basically, 
so that's basically why you have those two different wings one is the unit for more like um that's more i guess more stable um being on <clears throat> supplying by itself and then the unit is more has more of a profile and and is that kind of the thought behind well that? i mean we 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 go for a lot of uh canopy tension on both models of wings we're not going to compromise on canopy tension because it gives it helps give lift to the wing when it's just laughing and, and it it improves power when you're pumping it improves deep power and stability when you're overpowered so we're not going to compromise on uh, canopy tension mm -hmm. but the difference one of the differences between the slick and the unit is the unit has uh, more uh, sweep in the leading edge and that helps improve the uh, stability while it's luffing if you're surfing a wave and holding it by the front handle the fact that it has more sweep than the slick makes it a little more stable in that respect than the slick but then the, the downside is you have more wingspan so it's easier to catch a wing tip you know so by, by sweep you're, you're saying like the fr leading edge in the front is a little bit more like this versus like that kind of thing or what, what do you mean by sweep sweep is the uh, you know how some airplanes, like a fighter jet, will have wings that are swept back? Mm -hmm. And some wings, like a sailplane, will have wings that are not swept back. So mm -hmm. sweep is is that back angle in the leading edge. Understood. Okay. And dihedral is the up angle in the leading edge. So we've done quite a bit with different dihedral patterns. And, uh, you know, some things I thought would be better weren't. So I thought a progressive dihedral would be more stable than a linear dihedral. Um, and a linear dihedral is actually more stable. So the new, <clears throat> the new unit has a very linear dihedral shape. And uh, another, another thing that's kind of interesting is some wings have very little dihedral. And the advantage of that is when the wing is lying flat on the water, it's less likely to flip over. The disadvantage of that is it's hard to have uh, a wing with a deep canopy and with a lot of canopy tension when you have little or no dihedral. So again, we're, we're giving up the fact that our wings, when they're lying belly down on the water are more likely to flip over than somebody else's might. But on the other hand, we have the ability to put in more depth while maintaining really good canopy tension because we have more dihedral. So would you say would you say there's a downside to having more canopy tension? Like to to me it seems like the more tension you have, the I mean the the better the profile works. But I guess like sometimes on a wave or whatever when you're luffing it, it has a little bit more drag, right? Is that, or like, what, what's your experience you, with the tension? Uh, the canopy tension gives you less drag. If you have, yes. if you have, if more canopy tension gives you less drag when you're luffing, but the wing is more stable while luffing if it has um, a, a bit less canopy tension. Like if I let some air pressure out of my wing and make it, have less canopy tension, it'll flutter more, and that makes it draggier, and sad to say, it makes it more stable. Uh, yeah, because so it basically kind of, kinda, the, when when it doesn't have a lot of tension, it can just completely flatten out and just kind of flutter flat, right? Versus a, yeah, the tension has, it still has that profile, right? So Yeah, so the draggiest thing you can have is a wing that flaps and flutters and luffs. Mm. Um, but that drag imparts a certain amount of stability i see so this is one of those things where you it's hard it's hard to get it's hard to get everything you want right there's trade-offs okay so um so maybe talk a little bit about things you've tried early on that were kind of that ended up on the trash heap and versus you know like like things that yeah. i guess like the the full battens you said in the beginning you tried them or use them to um, reduce the flutter. But I mean, I yeah. remember those battens used to break really easily too in the waves, right? So the, they're kind right. of thin, yeah. thin battens. 
Yeah, so early on, I, I never really even imagined I would be using a wing in the waves, which is why I didn't mind putting batons in. <laughs> right. Of course, they, they don't, they're not really compatible with waves. I did, I did make a three strut wing early on. My, uh, my fourth wing in 2000, fifth wing in 2018 was a three strut wing. And, um, it was, you know, perceptibly heavier. So I didn't make any more three strut wings for a while. Um, the, um so by, sorry, by three struts, you mean like three inflatable struts like this kind of? Yeah. So the, the blue one. Yeah. The, the 3.0 E. From July of 2018. Yeah. Yeah. I tried that and it was, you know, not a great wing and a little on the heavy side. So I decided I was going to try to stick with just one strut and then actually went to a boom after that mm -hmm. for the simplicity and the low cost and so forth. Um, so the three strut thing is, is something I abandoned early on, but it does have potential advantages. So we've been doing more work with that. F1 has a nice three strut wing. I mean, it, it has its pros and cons, but there are people who like it. Um, and uh, one of the reasons is the fact that you have the strut takes away the corner, the, um, the back corner at the tip of a wing. And that's the place people drag most often when they're trying to get going. So, so getting rid um, of that. Well, I'm sorry. Let me share that again. Um, so what you're saying, like this corner is what drags in the water when you're trying to, to get foiling, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so a certain arrangement of three strut, I mean, a certain three strut geometry will get rid of that corner. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think F1 actually has like a patent um a patent or a patent pending for that third strut but like it looks like you were the first one to develop that so how how does that work well they they um they if they came to contesting it with us i don't think they could win but uh, i don't think either us or them are interested in having a, a fight so i don't think it'll be a problem for us right so so basically when i mean i know duotone is also has a I think you, I know you have a patent for the hand, the rigid handles on the unit. Are there any other patents that you're, you've um, gotten or applied for? And, and yeah, I think the question is like, why didn't you apply for a patent for the inflatable wings in the first place? Or did you? Um, well, because, I mean, I, I think in part you have to do it pretty quickly and it, it can't really be in the public domain. So these, these wings that I made in 2010, 2011, um, I, from what I understand is they, they were out there in the public domain and they were, they happened many years before. And so just trying to patent an inflatable wing, uh, I don't think that was an option, but we, we've tried to, I mean, we've applied for patents on various aspects of the inflatable wing design mm -hmm. as, you know, things related to the dihedral and, uh, boom and uh, trying to think what can I mention what can I not there's some things uh, we do that um, we don't even talk about because some people aren't aware and we don't want to give them ideas yeah you don't want to give away your secret sauce right so I understand not, not too, I not too soon yeah <laughs> yeah Okay, so actually, I had a question from from a friend, my friend Steve. Um, he, he was asking, "Have you ch or about basically, you know, on windsurf sails where, like, you, with the camber inducer and stuff, you have like a luft tube to kind of um, improve the f laminar flow on the on the bottom yeah, side of the wing." Sure. Have you yeah. tried that? Have you tried playing with that? And like, or what are yeah, your thoughts on that? Yeah. That, that's a popular topic. It, it came up in, um, in connection with kite design years ago. And I think when I was picking up my, the first kite that I actually owned from Don Montague, he was talking about that very idea and doing it in connection with kites. And Don Montague has done an amazing amount of work along those lines in connection with kites and wings 
if you were to see the PDFs he's put together when all of the things he's tried, you would be astonished. Don would be a really interesting guy for you to talk to on this. Don Montague, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, he was the kite designer for Nash 25 years ago or 23 years ago. And mm -hmm. he's moved on to a lot of really interesting things. Um, but he was talking about it then. He worked with it then. And, it, you know, it's never really worked uh, for kites for a variety of reasons. Um, there's weight. There's the tendency for uh, water to get in and weigh down the kite. Um, it's complexity, cost. And the actual benefit is hard to find. I've also tried to do elliptical leading edges in kites and wings where I have two leading edges side by side. Kind of uh, two bladders yeah. next to each other kind of thing? Yeah, exactly. Trying yeah. to thin out the, the shape of the wing and make it stiffer. And uh, that, that's that been really hard to make it work. There are people who you know try this stuff and they, you know, somebody's probably going to succeed at some point someday, but so far it hasn't worked. Um, one of the problems with double surface on a wing is that the lower surface tends to keep the flow attached. And that attached flow sucks the second surface down and actually tends to suck the whole wing down. So we spent a lot of time making sure our wings always lift. If you're luffing the wing, it lifts. If, it, if you get hit by a gust, it lifts. Every All the time, our wings are lifting. Well, if you add that second surface, boom, your lift goes away. The, the flow remains attached on the bottom of the wing as mm -hmm. it passes the leading edge, sucks the lower surface down, and sucks the whole wing down with it. And this is something I've actually experimented with and tried and observed. So I'm not just speculating here. Interesting. Um, again, I'm not saying it'll never work, but uh, it's it's not a slam dunk. It's not sort of an obvious, easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. And the benefits aren't obvious either, right? So <clears throat> and yeah, and better. it's more weight, it's more cost. Uh, so we and and with wings in particular, we have to we have to worry about weight. Windsurfers don't worry about weight nearly as much as we do currently. Um, Kiters you have to hold it, to. hold that thing up in in your hand, and light wind, especially, then the weight really makes a difference, right? Um, it does, yeah, for sure. Um, what about rigid wings? Like, um, I know people have been making rigid wings for like on the ice and stuff like that, but um, and Forever. have you played around with that, or have have you tested rigid? Yeah, wings? yeah. I, I mean, I thought early on I'd like to have a rigid wing that opened up like an umbrella. Mm -hmm. Um. And I, I actually have tried some rigid and hybrid uh, prototype uh, wings. But the, the problem you run into there is you lose one of the greatest uh, attractions of wings, inflatable wings, which is the simplicity and the, the fact that you just blow them up and go. And when you have rigid components, elements, you, you make them more complex, harder to rig up. Uh, they're less robust because something like a carbon fiber tube can break pretty easily, especially in the waves. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I question whether a lot of people would want to give up the simplicity and the robustness of an inflatable wing in order to get a little bit more speed or a little bit higher jump or whatever the rigid structure might give you. So uh, that's not a, a real priority for me right now. I, I mean, in fact, I would rather be working on stuff that makes it easier for kids and people who aren't uh, fanatical wingers, people who want to get into it but aren't going to be doing it every day. I would, I'm interested in making it better for families rather than right. better for Kai Lenny. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but on our wings, obviously you're... You're also very interested in going fast and, and you know, like, you know, testing. I, I know Anka just told me that you guys go out and, and kind of sort of race each other and see what what's faster and, and test equipment. And 
And that's, you know, he told me about the Mike's lab uh, foil that he let, you know, you let him try your foil and he got one himself and I just got one recently. So those are, yeah, I mean, just having a fast foil makes a big difference that alone, right? I, I do like, I do like going fast up to a point it, about the Mike's lab. What happened was uh, during the pandemic, we, we had a shortage of fanatic hydrofoils. We weren't getting the latest stuff. I mean, we weren't even able to get anything out of China for a while. And my wife is pretty into getting the latest stuff. So she ordered a Mike's lab hydrofoil and mm -hmm. she got it and she actually had a hard time with it. So I started using it. Um, so I used it a fair amount. Um, but she went to an 1100 Mike's lab and that worked really well for her. Then she moved to an 800, which worked really well for her. Then she went to a 600 and that worked well for her. And now she's, now she, um, now she, well, I don't know. She's she's sort of in the 540 to 800 range nowadays, depending on what she wants to do. Mm. Um, and so through all that, I've been using her hydrofoils as well, but I also use, Fanatic has some new stuff that I also use. Um, mm. Peter Slate, who I sail with a lot, is using Fanatic foils, and he's going really fast with those. He's hard to keep up with. Mm -hmm. And um, Alan, of course, is very hard to keep up with too. Yeah, and, and, and I, I guess I, I, should, sorry, I, I should say, I should say when we're talking about going fast and racing, I should say that I don't uh, try to go fast or race because I think that, um, well, I, I'm not sure how to put this. I think that racing with slow equipment is actually more interesting than racing with fast equipment. In the old days of windsurfing, we raced with really slow boards didn't matter that we were going slow because the important thing was trying to use the wind and the, the waves and, and whatever we found out there to go a, a little bit faster or to take a slightly shorter course than the next person. And <clears throat> so I don't think of speed as a prerequisite for getting on the water and racing. I think just getting on the water and racing with the stuff you have is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. so yeah i mean that's i guess the beauty of one design racing where everybody uses the same equipment and it's not an arms race and it's more about this your skill and and uh start strategy and so on right yeah exactly and it and i think of it as the most uh social form of winging on the water because you're actually doing something with other people and and it's a very sort of a responsive thing where you do one thing and somebody will do another thing in response. So you're, there's interaction that you don't have pretty much any other time, except when you're wanting people to stay out of your way on a wave, which is a, a different kind yeah. of interaction. But but getting back to the, the, the winging that Alan or Peter and I do, um, if, we're, if we're racing around side by side, trying to go faster, what? The, the main thing I'm doing is I'm trying to assess the performance of the wing. I'm trying to judge the power delivery. I'm trying to judge, is the power delivery consistent? If I hit a lull, does the power go away? How much do I have to adjust my sheeting angle? Is it is it um, easy to deal with a gust? Is it difficult to deal with a gust? When a gust hits, do I accelerate or do I just slow down because there's so much drag? And then, you know, we'll go upwind and we'll go downwind. And if we're going downwind, we can judge whether we can go deeper with one wing rather than another. And this, this all translates into performance that even someone who's not racing is, is going to appreciate. And you, you can notice subtle differences between wings when you're side by side with somebody of equal ability. Mm -hmm. um, that you can't notice if you're just out there cruising by yourself. So that that I think that's a real valuable thing for us. But the other thing we do is we've got uh, Finn and Jeffrey Spencer out there on our wings. They um, test every prototype that comes in. They write a, a little report on every wing that comes in. They go out, they loop them and spin them and race around with them, do everything that anybody does with them. Um, and you know, evaluate them 
in very thorough in a very thorough manner i think yeah so um i think originally they used to ride for um what's it called um they, they used to ride for slingshot slingshot yeah so how long have they been riding for duotone oh, the last few months okay yeah i mean they're they're amazing wingers so um talk a little bit about the r d process so i mean i guess it's like you can't really make too many changes at once yet right you have to kind of change one one variable at a time and then like and then like how many prototypes go into like uh you know like how many prototypes do you have to make to to come up with next year's wing you know kind of thing i'm just curious about yeah that. so for the 2022 four meter unit i i design um i name i name every prototype with a letter from the alphabet so i got down to q on on that one I'm not sure how many that's maybe 20 or so close to and 20. each one is one that you actually made is it just a, like do they all make it to the to be actually samples or those are all actual samples that you made that's, or? that's a that's a good question i might i might start on a wing design and try five different variations on my computer mm -hmm. uh but they'll all be the same letter that might be it might oh, be okay. 4b-1 so, or 4b-2 and I'll, okay. I'll i'll look at all those and then i'll decide which one i want to try um in person and i'll send the i'll generate patterns send the patterns to the factory the factory will ship it out a week later or five days later um and 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 then we'll test it but you know i can i can go through dozens and dozens of prototypes before we finalize a line like the unit from size two to size six point five, which is ten mm -hmm. sizes, and we yeah. do we do build and test every size before we put anything into production. Yeah, but I guess on Maui, like basically the four meter is is your like that's the one you start with, and then and then once you have a good four meter, then you start working on the mm -hmm. other sizes. Is, is that kind of how you do it, or? Um, usually I'll do a four or a five in a lot of iterations. I'll also do some sixes. I'll also do threes. I did a, quite a few threes on the latest slick design because it can be hard to get a, a three meter working really, really well. So we, mm -hmm. we made six or seven threes before we felt like we were in the right ballpark with, uh, with the slick. Yeah, I mean, because you, you can't really use the same design and just make it bigger and smaller. Because I mean, obviously, the bigger wings, the the one of the issues is that they have too much wingspan, so you have to make them kind of lower aspect. And then, but the smaller wings, it's not the wingspan isn't so much of an issue, right? So, like, can you talk a little bit about that? Like the differences between yeah. from your biggest wing to your mm -hmm. smallest wing in the same lineup, or is that? Yeah, that's that? exactly right. The the wingspan, the aspect ratio can be a, a little bit higher in the smaller wings um with the bigger wings we haven't really gone over seven and we haven't adjusted the aspect ratio that much up to there but in the future we'll, we'll probably have a seven and an eight with a little bit lower aspect ratio um another thing you can't scale exactly is well, pretty much everything you can't scale exactly. You have to you have to make adjustments with everything. So if you take a five meter that you like and you want to go smaller, you actually, as a percentage, have to go bigger with the diameter of the leading edge and the strut. Because if you if you were to scale those down exactly to a, like a three meter, the leading edge wouldn't be big enough in diameter to get the stiffness you want. And, and then it goes small, the other small wing. You really want a stiff leading edge because otherwise, when you're when you're winging and gusty wind, it'll just kind of bend, right? So, yeah. And exactly. and that let's talk yeah. a little bit about that. The leading edge diameter, like the um, you know how you know what you learned about that um, from all your designing and 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 where you know what what are your thoughts on that? And also the different materials. I know you're doing the unit um, D labs with the Alula fabric and stuff like that, and can you make the diameter thinner with the different fabric if you have more pressure and so on? Just go talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, 
at first, of course, I was trying a lot of different diameters to see what seemed to work okay at my weight. And one of one of the issues we have is people of all different weights are doing the sport. And I mean, we kind of have to optimize around the average weight of the average rider. Um, so why are you showing that? Oh, I just wanted to um, bring up some of the wings and like the, the different, uh, um, I was going to show the Alula wings and stuff like that. Okay. But, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry to <laughs> distract you there. Yeah. So leading edge diameter is a huge topic. And, you know, we, most of us who test are in the 140 to 190 weight range. So we tend to optimize for that weight range. And, um, a four meter wing has a diameter of about 10 inches at the, the center. And at eight PSI or eight and a half, nine PSI, that seems to, to be stiff enough for most people. We've uh, tried going smaller diameter when we go to our Alula wings or D-Lab wings are made out of Alula right now. And Alula is great because it's very light, it's very stiff. And you would think that since it's so stiff, you could go smaller in diameter. But after making quite a few prototypes with a uh, smaller leading edge, we, we see both advantages and disadvantages. So you can have uh, a little less drag if you're going upwind or if you're in a lot of wind, you get less drag with a uh, smaller leading edge. But if you lose a little bit of air pressure, then you have a softer leading edge. And the smaller the leading edge, the more sensitive, sensitive it is to small losses in air pressure. Um, so with our DLAD wings, our Lula wings, we've decided to just keep the, the diameter about the same. And anybody that wants a little bit softer leading edge can let a little air out. And then um, bigger riders, the 200 pounders or 210 pound riders will have something that's fully stiff enough to handle their weight. So um, that's one of the trade-offs we've made with um, leading edge diameter. Another yeah, so thing basically you found that you can't really like, even though the Alula can handle more pressure, you can't really reduce the, um... The leading edge diameter by much so or not really we can it's just when we do it we find that we're not happy with the trade-offs mm -hmm. and so we're, we're we're leaning toward being conservative we won't we don't want we don't want people to have unreasonable well we don't want their expectations to be stymied so um yeah, we're, we're getting the best all around performance by keeping the leading edge diameter pretty substantial. Recently, for example, we made two identical slick prototypes, one with standard leading edge diameter, one with uh, maybe a, not quite a 2% drop, but a, about a two centimeter reduction from about 10 inches to a little over nine inches. And the smaller, leading edge diameter had advantages as we expected. You know, if we were going upwind in a lot of wind, the guy on the uh, smaller leading edge had, a, had an advantage. Um, but overall, it had a little less power, a little less grunt. And if we lost a little bit of air pressure, it had a little less stiffness. And we felt like those were big enough uh, problems to um, keep us away from that. Okay. So, Can you talk uh, a little? Another, Sorry, another thing we did related to leading edge stiffness is we put a 230 gram Dacron in the center. That white panel, those white panels in the center are a heavier, stiffer Dacron. Um, so we put those in a place where there's a lot of stress on the leading edge and um, both in terms of point loading where the the strut attaches and uh, that leading edge handle attaches and the leash attaches. 
and it's also a point where there's a lot of bending load. Um, <clears throat> so that helps make our, our leading edge stiffer. I know a lot of brands will double up on their cloth there, and which we did at one point, but we, we really prefer the single layer of 230 gram Dacron. It's very robust. Interesting. Um, can you explain um, like how, why you recommend different pressures for depending on the size of the wing? Like I, I see here the 2.0, you're recommending 12 PSI and then for the 5.5, 7.5 and kind of in between. So you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, the load on the, the, the seams, well, first I should say the closing seam of a leading edge has the most load on it of all the seams. It has twice the load on it of an intersegment seam. The intersegment seams are the ones between panels of cloth. So we do a lot of uh, testing to try and maximize the strength of our closing seam. But one thing about closing seams is the load on the closing seam is related to, it's proportional to the pressure times the diameter. So if you have a small diameter you can have higher pressure without overloading the closing seam. But if you have a big diameter, you have to have lower pressure to avoid overloading the closing seam. And I, I think every, everybody understands this in the business. They are all recommending higher pressure for small wings and lower pressure for big wings. And it's all related to how much load the closing seam can handle without breaking. I, I see, okay. Do you... Um... Our standard Dacron construction can handle 15 or 18 PSI in a four meter size before it breaks. And I've, I've done test tubes. I do a lot of test tubes where we test the strength of seams and cloth. I've done test tubes where I've taken it up to 25 PSI in the standard diameter for a four meter um, before it breaks. Uh, so we do we do actually quite a bit of lab testing and bench testing on things like seam strength and cloth strength. <clears throat> so um, so the the difference between the unit and the D lab unit is basically just the material of the leading edge edge and the strut. Is that correct? Otherwise, yeah, the... that's correct. Another difference is that the the materials stretch a little differently and they require different. Uh, seam construction. So I can't use the same patterns for the D-Lab that I use for the unit. I have to customize the, the patterns for the D-Lab wings mm -hmm. to make adjustments to allow for different, not just different stretch, but also different shrinkage because different seam construction will take up more cloth. You know, one seam construction might take up X amount and the other seam construction will take up 1.5 X amount. So I have to make those adjustments in the patterns. And then I've noticed, um, let's talk a little bit about the flutter in, in wings. Um, I noticed like, looks like the unit has like this little tiny um, batten thing versus the D-Lab doesn't have that. Is that, what? what's the reason for that? Uh, no, the D-Lab has it. They just didn't put it in the graphic. Oh, okay. <laughs> they both have it. So, yeah, um, but, it. but um, I mean, that's one thing I noticed like the, first generation wings they would kind of um get really baggy quickly or like you know after a few months of using them they would get all bagged out and um and you would lose a lot of performance and there would be a lot of flutter in the in, especially in the trailing edge so how 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 did you do you eliminate that or how, how are you able to um get away without battens in the in the trailing edge and and avoid yeah, having a flutter yeah. and stuff a, like that a, about a year and a half ago we we decided we were going to attack that problem and we we built some wings with different materials uh stronger ripstop materials for the canopy and we sent them out to team riders in schools around the world and and got feedback on how durable the different materials were and so the material we use in the canopy the white material you see in the canopy of the no not that one that so that one has standard height uh, ripstop, which is 50 gram ripstop, which is uh, pretty good stuff, especially if you get this 
the panel um, alignments right and you get the warp orientation right. But then the wing you're showing now, the, the 2023 D-Lab, um, which I think is coming out tomorrow. Oh, wow. Um, that has our, what we're calling mod, mod three for modulus three ripstop material in the canopy. So the white material in that canopy has three times the bias stretch resistance of the standard kite style um, ripstop. And that makes it not only more resistant to things like uh, rips when you, when you uh, drop it on your hydrofoil, but really makes it more durable and uh, a higher performance material. It makes our standard unit feel more like a V-Lab unit because it's more solid. And when you're pumping it, you get a better response. It's not a spongy response. It's a, it's a more rigid response. When you hit a gust, the draft is really super stable. Um, so all around, it's, it's a big improvement. There's a small weight penalty, of course. Um, but we we did some testing where we built three nearly identical six meter wings, and we put different amounts of this mod three material in the canopy of each one. So they would they differed in weight by a bit, um, and we found that the canopy with the most with the largest amount of this material in it was far and away the best performer. So we decided to put it in in all of our wings for 2023. Okay. <clears throat> I think we're the first to actually come up with a wing dedicated canopy material. So that uh, so basically that combats that um bagginess after after using it for a while that it doesn't stretch as much basically. Right, so. exactly. Yeah. Um I just noticed that okay, yeah, so this is kind of the traditional canopy, the mod three, you just have um less um stretch in especially in the um diagonal direction right yes exactly um so i just noticed that for the um unit um you recommend i mean the the d lab wings you recommend a lower pressure than the regular unit wings why, why is that uh well you you get more stiffness uh for for the pressure you know whatever your given pressure is the d lab gives you more stiffness but um, the thing about Alula is it's incredibly strong and stiff. It's incredibly strong everywhere except where you put a hole in it. <laughs> so if you, you know, we have to sew these things together so they have thousands of holes in them. And we do a lot of reinforcement on the uh, seams with materials that are not Alula. Um, but our testing shows us that these are the numbers we should be using for inflation to be safe. And so even though you might pump a, a five meter to seven instead of eight, it's going to be stiffer at seven than a Jackron wing at eight. Okay. So, I mean, you, you just said, so tomorrow you're going to release the new, um, the, the 2023 wings. Um, I, I think on your website, this is still your 2022 model, right? So what are no, the, that, or that, is that, 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 that D lab you're pointing at is the 2020. Oh, well, I'm wrong. It's the 2022. You're right. It's got the windows for 2022. So, so what has changed? I, I think, I, I think I've seen Alan Cadiz with some wings that have like two windows here. Is that, is that like one of the ways you can tell or? Uh, yeah. So the new, the new units have windows that are more like the current slick. The 2022 slick has four windows, not just two of them. Right. And mm -hmm. that improved our, that improves the visibility quite a bit. So let's talk a little bit about the seam orientation. I, like, cause it seems like the seams have a little bit more, um, I mean, they don't stretch as much as the fabric, right? So is that, is, is that you're trying to use the seams to add more, um, basically more tension to the canopy? Is that what your thought well, is on that? Well, or? What I'm doing there is I'm, I'm trying, with the wing design in general, I'm trying to get more tension from tip to tip, fan-wise across the canopy. And mm -hmm. 
in order to deal with that tension, I'm or I'm making the thread orientation run tip to tip. So it's more about getting the thread orientation of the cloth aligned with um, the loads that I'm trying to put in the cloth. And that's actually evolved a bit. Uh, you know, those, those seam angles have changed for 2023. Um, and I, I'm surprised there's no photo anywhere of the 2023s. They've been out for a while now. Mm. Um, the, the Duotone Sports website doesn't have the new wings. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah i don't know but um yeah i mean so i mean talk a little bit about the changes that you did make in the in the wings from 22 to 23 uh, you know i guess the windows the seams but what else has changed well yeah the, the cloth is a huge thing it's a it's a really big thing because it makes the, the wings last longer and up to now the leading edge materials have lasted longer than the canopy materials and you really want everything to break all at once ideally. Um, so we changed the windows, we changed the canopy cloth, we increased the depth and the power of the wing a bit. The, the profile depth is greater. Um, so we are getting more power, but the canopy cloth itself also improves the top end. So we have more wind range overall. We um, we refined the tip angles. You know, tip angles, tip twist has a lot of influence on wing performance. And so we've been we've gone through a lot of prototypes trying to find the tip angles that are best. Um, so I'd say we have an improvement in overall power delivery, in part because we've got better control over our uh, tip twist. Um, trying to think what uh, else we've done. Is um, um, I know I'm forgetting something. So the, this wing that Alan Cadiz is using is probably the the 23, right? Is, um, that's probably a 2023 20, prototype. Right. That's that's one of our prototypes where we were trying different canopy materials. That orange material is one of the materials we we tested for use uh, in production. And we we decided not to use it, but it's a very good material. We might use it in the future, it's possible. Okay. <clears throat> Interesting, cool. Well, that's cool that um, you're able to talk about that. It's gonna be released shortly. For wing design, like what's what's your philosophy and, and what, are you, what are you trying to accomplish when you're designing a wing? I mean, I guess for the slick. I really like a wing that delivers power as you know very consistently across the wind range. And you know, I've I've ridden a lot of wings. I you know I've ridden wings that don't do that. Most wings in the past haven't done that, and we're getting better and better at keeping the power on at all times. I like a wing that's always lifting. Um, a lot of people don't have that yet. I like a wing with good canopy tension for low flutter, um, good pumping. Uh, never want, I never really want to have to move my hands because I'm in a gust. You know, the old days of windsurfing and the old days of winging, you hit a gust, you have to move your hand back. In windsurfing, you had to move your hand back on the boom, and winging, you used to have to move your hand back to another handle or something, which is one of the reasons I liked having it boom <clears throat> at first because I could just slide my hand back. I didn't have to let go and grab another handle. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, the wings, our wings are so stable that I never really have to move my hands back or forward when a gust or a lull hits. They're always in the right place. Uh, so that's really important to me and I think it's important to everyone. So when I'm thinking about the sport in general and how to you know, how to make the sport appealing to more people, I think about the fact that we we get families doing winging. We get you know, 
my the guy who actually runs our wing brand, a guy named Klaus in Germany, lives just off the Baltic Sea near Kiel. He has a seven-year-old son who started winging when he was five. And um, yeah, I think that's awesome. I, I love the idea of families being able to do the sport. So I don't ever want to lose focus on making it easy, making it accessible, making it affordable. I mean, we're a high-end brand, so we don't tend to go for the bargain basement type wings. Um, but we do want to make quality wings at a reasonable price, and I don't really side of that. So, yeah, and like in terms of price, like obviously the Lula wing is much more expensive, the material. Like, and like what, how much of a performance advantage do you actually get out of, out of that material? And like, is it, is it, will only like someone notice that, like, is it just for high performance wing foiling or do you think the average user, it's a big advantage for them to go with the Lula fabric? Yeah. I mean, anybody that can afford it will benefit from it. It's just a question of, do you want to spend the money and, you know, where are your priorities? And <clears throat> You have three kids you have to worry about until you can't spend money on the Lula wing. Um, my wife likes them because they're light and she doesn't need the stiffness, but she likes the low weight. So she always wants to be on an Lula wing hmm. if possible. Uh, bigger riders, like the you know, someone who weighs 200 pounds, is going to really benefit from the stiffness, or somebody who likes to jump will benefit from the stiffness. Um, most people, it's totally a matter of whether they want to spend the money or not. You, there's always a benefit. And the bigger the wing, the greater the benefit. So a six meter gives you more benefit in a Lula than a three five in a Lula, for sure. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about the equipment that you use personally. Like, what's your go-to wing? Like on Maui, I know you have. I mean, what, what which wing do you use the most? You know, on on an we, we use fours and fives here a lot. Three three fives, fours and fives a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, on a sea breeze days, sea breeze day when it's blowing six eight knots, I can be on a seven or eight pretty easily, and. You know, of course, if it's blowing like it has last week, I can easily be on a two. Um, and do you prefer the you, unit or the um, the slick wing for your for your personal use? Uh, you know, I I really like booms a lot because I can. It's easier to locate my harness lines precisely, and I can put my hands anywhere, and I can fly one handed when I say I'm getting from my from a sitting position to a kneeling position. Um, you know, I can one hand the boom and that makes it easier to one hand the wing. Um, uh, but, you know, I used to hate handled wings, but we have, our handles are good enough that I like the units also. So what I, it's pretty much whatever I'm working on is what I'm riding. So lately, I've been working on slicks mostly and I've been riding slicks mostly. But uh, in the coming few months, I'll be working on units entirely and so I'll be riding units. So what changes have you made to the slick wing for 2023? Like what, what are the, the... So we, we did a lot of the things on the new slick that we did on the unit. So we went to the Mod 3 canopy cloth. Um, we kept the four windows because we like that. We have gone with more canopy depth and more power. We fine-tuned the tip twist and we had some reflex quite a bit of reflex in the strut of the 2022 slick. Well, with the new canopy cloth, should, first I should point out that the thing the reflex did was it made it so that the back of the canopy didn't bag out so much um, when you get a gust or if you're out in high wind. So the reflex in the strut improved the top end performance of the slick by a lot. However, with our new canopy cloth, we don't have that that bagginess in the in the cloth, so we were able to tone down the reflex by quite a bit. It's just a maybe three degrees now of reflex in the strut. Um, I should point out also that 
the wider tips of the slick make it so that the slick benefits more from a little bit of reflex than um, the unit. The unit has narrower tips, so it, and it works different. Um, what else on the slick? Um, we've changed the shape of the strut uh, a little bit, and um, yeah, overall it's. It's it's a liftier, smoother, liftier wing, smoother wing. The power development is actually the smoothest of any wing I've tried. So when we're we're sailing along through gusts and walls, we feel the gusts less uh, with the slick than we have with any other wing we've ever tried. Okay, and then what about um, your board and your foils? Like what 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 are your go what's your go to, go to equipment on that? Yeah. So I don't I don't use small boards. I did a little bit a while ago, but I don't jump, so I don't really need a small board. Um, I've been using 75 liter five foot boards quite a bit uh, for the last year or two, and lately I've been on a five four that's 24 wide, and we're trending narrower. Um, some of us are trending narrower just because if you're on a small hydrofoil. If you have a little bit longer, narrower board, you can pop up on the foil more easily. Um, but a longer board isn't necessarily good for waves. So anybody who's on, you know, heavily into waves isn't going to be on a longer board. I see but there's probably. About, hmm. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just going to say the tail shape. I mean, I know it, um, people used to have all the, the kick tails and all that, but it seems like with the you know, the smaller, faster foils, high aspect foils, you need, it's almost like you don't want to kind of pop up at a steep angle. You want to keep that board as flat as possible on the takeoff, right? So do you do you still use that kick, kick tail or is it just a flat tail on your board? <clears throat> yeah, I haven't used kick tail in quite a while. Uh, and I think those were mostly valuable uh, in the bigger boards because it was hard to get the nose up to get some angle of attack on the hydrofoil so that you would lift. And of course, with a small board, getting the, sinking the tail and getting the nose up is easy. So I think you don't really need any kick for a small board. Mm -hmm. the, the boards I use, my mast is about six or seven inches from the tail of the board. So there's just not much back there mm -hmm. um, to keep it from kicking up in the nose. And then how long is your mass? Like what what mass length do you like? Uh, I've been using them in the 90 to 95 range a lot. And um, I've used longer, but there's a lot of shallow water around here. So yeah, I was going to ask, what's the disadvantage? So a lot of times it's just like you don't want to hit the reef, right? <laughs> yeah. The longer, longer mass are either they're... To keep them stiff, they have to be a bit heavier and maybe a little thicker, which is not necessarily attractive. Um, and then there's, you always have to look at what the tide's doing. Where I ride, I, I don't like to go out if there's less than a foot of water, uh, you know, a foot above mean low water. And if it's two feet, that's better. <laughs> right. Yeah, and sometimes I'll just go to the harbor if it's a super low tide time of day and I need to test something, I'll, I might go to the harbor because at least I know they can get away from the beach without hitting the bottom. I'm, I'm curious, like, because you've done a lot of testing, like when you get scratches on your foil from like hitting the reef a few times, like um, all my foils are pretty scratched up. How much does it affect the performance, like in your experience? Hugely. Hugely. Yeah, right? yeah it's terrible. Uh, I feel it. I mean, uh, I've had, I won't say bad luck, but I have had collisions with things in the water that have destroyed my foils. And uh, you really notice, uh, yeah, you notice everything if you're, if you, if you're sailing with somebody else, you notice because you're going slower all of a sudden. If you're do not. You, do you repair, um, scratch, do you try to repair scratches in your foils or like, is there a way oh, to yeah. fix it? Like yeah. how do you, how do you repair scratches on the bottom of the foil? Well, I usually try to keep the scratching to a minimum and right. I'll, I'll uh, just use a little tiny bit of two-part epoxy to fill the scratch. Um, just 
you know, just enough to fill it and then sand it smooth. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to get some epoxy paint so that I can, you know, do a proper paint and sand job on some foils. Uh, but I haven't got around to that yet. You can't get it shipped here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that, that would be like a two-part paint, um, epoxy paint kind of thing? Yeah, or there's a stuff called Durapox out of, I think, Australia that uh, America's Cup campaigns use for their hydrofoils and, and boat hauls. Huh. That's supposed to be really good. But you have to ship it by boat probably or something like that, yeah? yeah. I think so, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then and then what like we talked a little bit about the Mike's lab foils, but like what what foils do you use the most and um what sizes and so on? Yeah, so we have a Fanatic has a really nice 590. It's I don't think it's in the shops yet. It's a 590 front wing that uh I really like. They we have a, a 725, we we've got an 850, we've got you know, a lot of different sizes up to, I guess, 2000 still. And on the um, website, do you know? I really don't know. It's on the website. Mm, okay. You just have a look real quick, but okay. So, so that's pretty small for you. Yeah. 590 is a uh, pretty small foil size for you. Um, I mean, you're, yeah. you're not, you're not probably not as light as Alan Cadiz or someone like that. Right. Yeah, Alan and I, I mean, I, I use a Mike's Lab 540 sometimes. My wife uses it too. And um, so Alan and I can sail around both being on 540s, but I outweigh them by 60 pounds or 50 pounds. So it's funny how that, that can work. The, the, um, for most days around here, something like a 590 is a really nice size for me. Mm -hmm. um, Lighter wind days, the 725 is good. Hmm. It's a very powerful wing for its size. So um, I, I was looking at the, um, so are they the duotone foils or the fanatic foils? Did you say? Those are oh. the ones you're, you're showing. The, the, there's, those are uh, kite hydrofoils, oh, duotone okay. kite hydrofoils. Okay. Um, and they're not the, they're not the latest stuff. I don't know if we have the latest stuff on the website because it's it's been quite the challenge to get the new stuff out of Asia. It's basically not not in, available yet, basically. Yeah, I think so. Uh, okay, so probably by spring on the mainland. Okay, and that and but the the so the foil that five. 590 that you're saying you're using is I assume that's a pretty high aspect, um, pretty thin, fast foil. Is that kind of what, what you how you yeah, would describe yeah, it? It's, yeah, high aspect, it's probably 10 to 1 aspect ratio and uh, designed to be fast. We have a CFD guy, a computational fluid dynamics guy in Germany who does work for a lot of projects like America's Cup campaigns and He's designed some profiles for us for our mast and for our our wings that we think are really very competitive. I, Peter rides his stuff all the time, and he's extremely hard to keep up with. So I have no doubt that it's fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it's pretty amazing how much the foils have improved over the last couple or you know last three years or so. Like, I mean, coming from the early go foils. I mean, what, what foils did you start on? Well, I was designing our kite hydrofoils and our windsurf hydrofoils. And we had some decent kite and windsurf hydrofoils. And then when I started making them bigger, they weren't very good at first. So I started on some real crap foils. Very, very difficult to ride hydrofoils. Mm -hmm. um, then over time, they got better and better. and uh, <clears throat> and became pretty easy to ride um, over the period of some months and maybe a year. Okay. Um, so I just I mean, want some to... of the a lot of those hydrofoils you just showed on the website are things that I designed. Oh, right. A couple of years ago. 
Yeah. So actually, let's talk a little bit about the challenges that, you know, during the pandemic, you know, the whole supply chain issues and logistics, shipping issues and things like that and delays and, and, you know, the demand, obviously, during the pandemic, when everybody was like, um, not staying, you know, c couldn't people couldn't go to work. So they had more free time. It seemed like that's when winging just kind of took off, you know, like, I know here on Oahu, it was like, you just couldn't we couldn't get enough stuff you know there was like more way more demand than supply and then now yeah. it seems like kind of where it's almost like the op opposite way where there's like everything's back in stock and people are back in at work and not buying as much so i don't know just like can can you talk a little bit about that and your experience with that well you you, you pretty much said it all it, except for the fact that uh when the pandemic hit maui was paradise there was no traffic. There was no people on the beaches. It was, it was, it was an amazing time in certain respects. Uh, you know, sad in many respects, but um, not for everyone. Not equally for everyone. Um, my workload didn't diminish at all. I had a lot of design work to do and a lot of testing to do, and so life didn't change for me. It did change for a lot of, obviously, for a lot of people. And yeah, the supply supply problems were an issue. We, we couldn't get prototypes uh, for a time, for a short time, but the, the people in the factories, they were they were very aggressive about getting back to work. And I, you know, I think we were lucky that they were able to do that. Okay, Ken, sorry about that. I, I My computer just kind of shut down all of a sudden. I think I had maybe a power surge or something like that. So, but we're back on and um, while we're trying to get back on, you, you did a little screen share of your um, software that you use to design um, design your wing. So if you're uh, willing to share some of that, that's pretty cool stuff. We'd love to see that, of course. Okay. So yeah, you can see your screen now. Yes. Tell us about what you're doing there. Um, so this is a um, unit D-Lab 3.5 and I don't usually, I don't always have handles on the model, but I'm putting a handle on the model now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I can put another handle on there, make it about 60 cm high, make it about 300 millimeters long. And so there you have the wing with. Leading edge handle and that's too far back. Yeah, so so what do you shoot for with the handle locations? Like when you're winging, do you want your hands to be right in the middle of those rigid handles, or is it something where you kind of more towards the front, more towards the back? Like how do you determine <clears throat> where where to put these handles? Yeah, we I get feedback from. Uh, a variety of people, people who weigh different amounts and ride in different ways and just try to position them so that nobody ever complains about running out of handle <laughs> when they when they are in a lull or in a gust or, um, you know, yeah. I guess that's mostly a gust or lull. If you, if you look at these little dots that I'm highlighting, running my mm -hmm. cursor around, I see that. those represent places I found where my hands work pretty well. So I, you know, mm -hmm. that scale, those dots scale with every wing so that if it's a 3.5, you've got them. And if you've got a 6.5, you've got them. So going back to the 3.5, this is, this is the, um, you know, it's, this is the model that I developed to create the 3.5 meter D lab unit. Mm. And okay. uh, you can see it looks a lot like the actual uh, pictures, if you ever find a picture of it. Yeah, nice. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you were saying earlier about the reflex? Can you explain what you mean by, by reflex and, and, and changing the reflex depending on the, like, because of the changed fabrics and so on? Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. Um, for that, we would want to look at a slightly different wing. 
I mean, uh, or on this on this one, maybe just talk about um, the you have that uh, the left pocket kind of that orange left pocket in the front, and then in the back, um, the wing is connected directly to the um, bladder or the the strut. And like, what what's the um, reasoning behind that? Oh, so sorry, yeah. Um, yeah. So um, on so this is a a model of a flick, and this is a wing that has uh, some reflex in the strut. You can see how it it bends up in the back, and mm -hmm. the. That's just something that helps maintain tension in the belly of the canopy, you know, in the this area of the canopy in a gust. Instead of getting a big baggy bit of cloth back here that moves the center of effort back, we've managed to keep tension in this cloth that tends to stretch a lot anyway. We manage to keep tension in there, and so it handles gusts better. And okay. as for whether to have a an infill panel here or not, well, with the slick, we have to have the boom attaching to the front of the strut. So the front of the strut has to be down here. It can't be way up there. So we have to have a strut that attaches to the canopy by means of an infill panel. And the reason we have the infill panel there at all is to help maintain control over the shape of the canopy in the center mm -hmm. um, so it's it's like having the strut there without out actually without actually having the strut there with the unit um you know we didn't really want the handles to be at steep angles to each other so um we we couldn't have the strut angled way up to the canopy and coming back down so we made the infill panel longer. Mm -hmm. And and why do you have that little bend in the strut, like where it kind of goes up a little bit and then back down again? Is there what's the reason for that? Instead of just having all go all the way across straight. Yeah. So we've we've actually, especially lately, we've experimented a lot with the um, ergonomics, and we find that a little bit of angle, six to eleven maybe 12 degrees of angle, somewhere in that range, between the two handles is really comfortable for the hands. Mm. So on the unit, that's something we want to maintain. Uh, but, you know, we, we're experimenting with a, a quite a few different ways of uh, arranging the handles to try and get like a really more intuitive and natural and comfortable feel when you're uh, riding with the wing. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then um, I mean, like, have you played around with trying to make the um, center of gravity a little bit lower? Like, I've I've kind of like wings that have the the strut almost a little bit lower, where it kind of feels more stable with having a lower center of gravity. I guess. Yeah, there's something to be said for that. An airplane with a low center of gravity and high dihedral will be sort of inherently more stable and um yeah there's something to be said for that but i've also noticed that with the the slick with the handle essentially being a little closer to the strut there are advantages to that too so mm -hmm. yeah i mean we're we kind of go back and forth on that well uh, i think I think the ergonomics of it uh, is 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 an extremely important issue, and, and we we put a lot of attention on that. Okay, um, can you talk a little bit about the the back of the lead, uh, of this the strut? Um, is it's kind of pretty fat. It's, it seems like you you're going thicker than most other brands I've seen. Um, what's the reason for that? Like, um, why do you keep it thick all the way to the back? Well, uh, the I'm, I'm, I guess we want it, we want it to be stiff. We don't want, we don't want the wings to be too floppy. Mm -hmm. uh, this helps maintain, you know, leech tension. If the strut is stiff, that helps keep the canopy shape that we want. And, uh, 
going thinner doesn't i mean part of it is perception because i don't know this this is a six five and as a percentage the strut is a little thinner on the six five because mm -hmm. you gain stiffness so quickly as you go bigger in diameter that we don't need the strut on a 6.5 to have the same thickness as a percentage as the strut on a 3.5. Um, yeah, but, I've noticed that some some wings, like um, when you jump or something, you really put a lot of um, pull on your backhand. This this part of the strut, like right above the backhand, is where it kind of can uh, bend a little bit, right? So that needs to be pretty right. strong, actually, right? Yeah, yeah, we want that to be stiff and and strong. Yeah. And then the other part where the the leading edge tends to flex uh, right kind of where the strut connect, connects to the leading edge on, on some wings, I've noticed, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and then you, you said basically you, you try to combat that with uh, different ma Dacron material as well, right? In the, in the, right in the front of the... Yeah, on, on our Dacron wings, yeah, we have a, a heavier cloth in these two panels. And what about on top? I noticed there's like a different uh, kind of the black um, panel on top. Is that also a different material? That that part. So yeah, yeah the, this gray panel is uh, it's Dacron, and we put it there to prevent. Yeah, with kites we had a a tendency for valves to rub against the canopy and um, wear on the canopy, mm. and we have this one pump hose here that could wear on the canopy. So we, we, we put Dacron there to prevent that happening. I see. Um, yeah, it's a detail. Yeah. I mean, amazing how, um, yeah, how perfect it looks just on the computer like that. I mean, that must have taken, taken quite a while to get to that point where you have, um, yeah. Yeah, in, in, in four and a half years, I've gone through a lot of wings. For sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then all the seams on the front leading edge. Um, it seems like, do you need that many uh, um, seams? Or I guess that that way you just get a nicer, smoother curve than if you did less um, seams. Or uh, I mean, what's well, the reasoning behind having that many seams? Yeah, for for a time, I thought having fewer seams was nice because it could help keep the cost down. Uh, you know, less work at the factory keeps the cost down and makes it more affordable for the customer. But there are certain performance advantages to having more seams, and I'm not. I don't think I want to say why. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, awesome. I mean, yeah, I really appreciate you um, sharing sharing all that information. I mean, you're already kind of sharing probably more more than you should <laughs> i'm thinking but mm -hmm. but awesome stuff and i'm sure people are gonna love love getting all that information directly from you the designer so one, um, thing, we, one thing we do is uh we've been keeping the closing seam on the bottom of the leading edge and some brands are rolling it back sort of behind the leading edge mm -hmm. but there are there are pros and cons with that also there there there's some clear advantages to keeping it at the bottom of the leading edge and um, drag is a disadvantage. So there's a little extra drag from this, but there are other advantages that uh, have to do with wing shaping and aerodynamics that uh, cause us to leave it where it is. Interesting. It's not an accident that it's there. <laughs> Yeah. Um, what about bladders? I know in the early generations of wings, there, there was a lot of issues with the bladder, the, especially the strut bladder, the, you know, where it connects to the, um, the leading edge where, you know, if it, if it kind of folds a little bit or twists a little bit, it would um, pop, you know, yeah. So yeah. That, yeah. that happened a lot of the early ozone wings and stuff, but um, how do you keep that strut bladder in place so it doesn't? Um, I know, and then there are some wings that had strings attached to the bladders and so on. So how how do you combat the, yeah. the twisting and so on? Yeah. So one thing is we double up the thickness of the bladder at the front and at the back, and we we pull it in with two strings: a string at the top and a string at the bottom, so that mm -hmm. the bladder is forced to fill the spaces that need to be filled. And yeah, we had problems at first because we were using 
bigger diameter struts than we ever used with kites and bigger diameter leading edges than we ever used with kites. Um, so there were some challenges challenges to overcome there. For, mm -hmm. Fortunately, I think we're we're pretty pretty solid in that area now. Mm -hmm. So I, I just noticed on the slick wing, the center strut is actually kind of sticking out of the top of the wing. Like basically the instead of the um, the wing just being attached to the top of it, it's actually go, going down to the center of it. It's kind of interesting. What's your thought? What were your thoughts behind well, that? Well, that's that's just that's just the model. You know, I'm, I modeled the strut to have a little bit of reflex. Mm -hmm. But in reality, the canopy attaches to the top of the strut. It's just, oh. the, yeah, yeah, and okay. the amount of the amount of reflex you see there isn't. It's not really representative of reality because the the way the cloth stretches and the way the seams uh, shrink the cloth a little bit and whatnot. You know, for any number of reasons, it turns out a little different in reality. Mm -hmm. But in reality, the canopy is attached to the top of the strut. Yeah. So, and then when when the the wing is under load or in a gust. The the wing tips will kind of twist a little bit, right? From from um, from the pressure, and then the um, so and 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 you said that's kind of these you design the the amount of twist that that it has and so on. So can you talk a little bit about that, like what you learned about the the um, wing tips and the importance of the different angles and so on? Yeah, well, well, sadly, right now wings don't work the way windsurfing sails do. Windsurfing sails actually do twist at the tip mm -hmm. and um, they look great. Our, our wings don't do that. What, you know, when, when a, um, a wing gets loaded up, the twist happens here, like the canopy opens halfway out or two thirds of the way out from the, the center. And that actually doesn't, the way, the way these inflatable tips work, they don't actually twist. They, they might bend in a little towards ah. the center. Um, so when I when I talk about tip twist, I'm talking about something that's really static. So if you're looking at the wing from the side, you might. This isn't actually representative of reality, but you might build in a certain amount of angle in the tip, and a lot of that angle comes out because of the way the canopy pulls on the leading edge. It derotates the tip of the the tip of the kite or the tip of the wing. So you might you might build the wing with exaggerated tip twist because by the time it gets all the canopy tension on it, that gets pulled down to to like no twist at all. And that's a very static sort of thing. It doesn't it doesn't change in a desirable way while you're riding the way it will change with a windsurfing sail while you're riding. Mm. That's because your your leading edge too is it's equally stiff in I shouldn't say equally stiff in all directions, but it it doesn't have the huge stiffness in the leech direction that a windsurfing sail has, and the softness in the angle of attack direction that a windsurfing sail has. So the the way it you know the way it works is really different from what we would like it to work. And um, something we hope to overcome someday. That's actually something I wanted to ask you too. Like, um, you know, in windsurfing sails, you have a, usually you have a leech line that you can adjust. Like, you can adjust the tension in the in the trailing edge of that line. And have you have you played around with that? Have you tested that? Is that something that could make sense for wings or not really? Um, yeah, I don't think many windsurfing sails have that nowadays. Maybe they do. I haven't looked at one lately. Um, but no, I don't. I mean, I I put a little cup. I I tension the trailing edge with a little bit of a cupping, so that um, that keeps flutter down. Mm -hmm. um, I, but I I don't want a leech line really. Yeah, I've um, what we've noticed is like when you have a kind of an older wing that's a little bit stretched out, and if you hold it up against a newer wing. A lot of times the wing tips will just be um, a little bit wider because I guess the material stretches and then um, the wing tips kind of um, are wider than when on a brand new wing. Have, have you noticed that? Like, I, I uh, that that particular observation I haven't personally made. 
Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks so much for going into all this detail. I really appreciate that. Um, I know we've been talking for a long time. So do you have anything that you want to uh, leave leave people with? Like any comments on wing foiling or the community and so on? Um, I, I, I'm just really pleased to, to be part of it and enjoying it every day. And uh, uh, I've been doing this basically for 47 years and I uh, plan to keep at it for, for a bit longer. Um, and I, I really enjoy meeting all the different people I meet in this sport. And, uh, um, and it's been a pleasure talking with you about it. Thanks so much, Ken. I mean, thank you, and th thank you for um, bringing this sport to, into the world, really. I mean, the, the whole inflatable wing. I mean, you definitely have a big big role in, in bringing it um, to the market and, and um, just making it better and better. And um, the amount of progression is, is just, um, it's kind of mind blowing how quickly uh, wing foiling has gone from just a brand new sport to a super high performance sport, you know? I'm amazed every day. Yeah, it seems like that whole progression and wind, windsurfing, it probably took like 20 years to get to the point where uh wing foiling is now i mean i guess it's it's amazing yeah 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 and there and there's still a lot more to come i'm sure i mean it's just like a, we're still at the very beginning of it so yeah awesome yeah. okay hey, robert it's been a pleasure talking yeah thanks so much ken have a great rest of your day you too Aloha. You bye. take care okay so i hope you enjoyed this interview with ken winner Please remember to give it a thumbs up if you like the show. Um, you know, subscribe to the Blue Planet YouTube channel and so on. I really appreciate everyone that's still watching or listening to the very end. You're the ones I'm making the show for, the hardcore foilers that can't get enough information. And today's interview with all that information on the wings, I think was really special. So um, I think it's just gonna drive the sport forward. You know, for me personally, I'm, I'm super interested in this kind of stuff and I know other people are as well. So this show gives me the opportunity to speak to people like Ken and find out more about uh, what they're up to, which I think there's a lot of people out there that are just as interested in that as I am. So thank you for sticking around and uh, we'll see you next year. Uh, happy holidays and a happy new year. I'll see you in 2023 with more Blue Planet shows. All right, thanks for watching. Aloha and see you on the water.